And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the fault finding of the children of Israel and because they put the Lord to the test by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Moses struck the rock and God made water come out so that the people could drink. And Moses named the place Testing and Arguing, Massa and Meribah. The lessons from Exodus and from the Gospel of St. John share some marvelous similarities, the most obvious being that of water and thirst. Perhaps less obvious is the underlying spiritual problem that both situations share. Acedia, or spiritual sloth, is that problem. Put simply, acedia is a laziness or indifference in religious or spiritual matters. It is the very thing that we see not only in the griping and grumbling of the Israelites, quick to find fault in God's appointed leader, testing God and demanding him to give us water to drink. It is the very thing that we see, not only in the attitude of the Samaritan woman who doesn't realize who and what Jesus is, but mocks him because he does not observe the rules of social etiquette, and who also gives ambiguous, deceptive answers to his questions. Acedia is the very thing that is endemic in the lives of modern people, including many of whom call themselves Christians. Acedia describes a state of mental and emotional languor, lethargy, of not caring about the things of God, not being concerned with one's soul or spiritual life. Acedia, or spiritual sloth, can go so far as the refusal of the joy that comes from God, and even to the point of being repelled by divine goodness. It is something that you and I must guard against, for it is possible, yea, even likely, to be very active in externally, externally different things in this world, or active in things of the church for that matter, and at the same time to be slothful in spirit. In many ways, acedia is a sort of half-heartedness. It is easy to take on an attitude in which we say one thing and perhaps even desire and intend to be faithful, but when it comes down to it, our faith demonstrates no clear element of endeavor or committal. We might find that we have fallen into a sort of half-heartedness in prayer, when some small fragment of our heart has some expectation from prayer, while the rest of it more solidly, we think, relies on shrewdness or money, influence or self-will. If we spend any time at all examining our spiritual lives this Lenten season, we might discover that we, too, suffer from a touch of HDIS, half-heartedness of a divided intention syndrome, if you will. The symptoms of HDIS are profoundly evident in situations where we intend to do God's will, but then find ourselves demanding qualifiers or contingencies. For instance, I will pray as God requests, or I will serve the church reaching out in the community, or I will be faithful in attendance at worship as long as. 
or if it does not require that I go too far out of my way and that it doesn't demand too much of my time and effort. Or another symptom of half-heartedness of divided attention syndrome, HDIS, is discovered when we intend to do God's will, but only so that our own will may be incidentally gratified at the same time. For example, we will take part in God's work in the church, yes we will, but then there must be credit reflected. We expect that in some way or another our involvement may prove to have been a good thing for us, that we were so dutiful. Unsettledness, disorder, restlessness, confusion, hesitation, frustration, dissatisfaction are the common characteristics of the half-hearted life of a divided intention. It appears that in whatever seems to be troubling us, It is our own half-heartedness that is most of all to blame. All around us, we see the unrest, the weariness, and the strain gradually breaking down modern life. We get so tired of trying to blend what will not mix We spend so much of our strength in vain while we try to work two ways at once, serving two or more masters. Most of us know how difficult it is to bring our whole life into one allegiance. It is quite hard, quite hard to attain such a unity and a simplicity of trust. It is difficult to cast off our lingering love of worldly gratification and then to fasten all our affection upon the things of God. Yet, yet with God helping us, it is to a very great degree within our reach. With the grace of God, we can walk away from the stress of our half-hearted and fractured intentions and focus on what he wills for his children, discovering that in his service comes peace, the blessing of that clear-sightedness and of spiritual insight. We all face trials of doubt and onsets of unbelief, as did the Israelites in the wilderness, We all have lives in which there have been shortcomings and moral failings like the Samaritan woman. But the endurance of our faith does not depend on whether we have known the evidences of Christianity or its coherence as a theological system. The endurance of our faith does not depend upon its appeal to our higher emotions in the acts of worship, nor even the beauty of its moral ideal. The endurance of our faith does depend upon our knowledge of its power to penetrate our hearts and to convince us of our sinfulness and our need for a Savior. The endurance of our faith depends upon its power to break down our pride with the revelation of God's love and patience with us, even in our blindness and ingratitude, even in our obstinate rejection of his grace and goodness. We realize the power of our faith when it shows our broken and contrite heart, the first glimmer of that joy that comes with penitence, the joy that cannot be taken from us, the joy that a disciplined life may only deepen and confirm. 
We heard St. Paul say that as our faith matures, we gradually come to see that suffering does produce endurance, that endurance does produce character, and that character does produce hope that does not disappoint us. The lesson from Exodus began by saying, all the congregation of people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages. St. John the Evangelist offers us some hints by contrasting the unsatisfactory faith of the Hebrews based on a uh, uh, a superficial admiration of miracles. They loved those things. To the deeper faith of the woman at the well whose faith was based on the word of Jesus. In the same breath that they acknowledged that God delivered them from enslavement in Egypt, the Israelites grumbled in faithlessness about not having water to drink, and the next it would be meat. The Samaritan woman at the well had enslaved herself by seeking happiness in human relationships. Five so-called husbands had evidently not offered her happiness or peace. She at first misunderstands who Jesus is and is what sort of water it is that he offers. But when Jesus clarifies and he is speaking of the heavenly water that will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life, She says, Sir, give me this water. Jesus explains that true worship can come only from those begotten by the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit that raises them above the earthly level, above the level of flesh. The woman at the well, finally, as far as she is able, recognizes who Jesus is, and he affirms it. Many in her city believe in Jesus because of her witness, and Jesus was invited to stay with them, and even more believe because of Jesus' word and teaching. So, the peasants of Samaria who realize who Jesus is and what sort of water it is that he offers, readily come to know what the teachers of Israel did not know. Jesus is indeed the Savior of the world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.